This is the third Sunday of Advent. The lesson is from the Apostle Paul to the Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Brethren, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety, but in every prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. At that time, the Jews sent to John from Jerusalem priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? And he acknowledged and did not deny, and he acknowledged, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elias? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. They therefore said to him, Who are you, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What have you to say of yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the desert, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. And they who had been sent were from among the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John said to them in answer, I baptize with water, but in the midst of you there has stood one whom you do not know. He it is who is to come after me, who has been set above me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to loosen. These things took place at Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's listen to what two great church fathers have to say about this. St. John Chrysostom says, The Jews had a certain human attachment to John. They deemed it unfitting that he be held as less than Christ because of the many proofs of John's excellence, chief of which was his illustrious origin, for he was a son of a prince of the priests. Then there was his austere youth and his renouncing of all human ties. In Christ was seen the opposite, his lowly birth, with which they reproached him, saying, Is this not the son of a carpenter? Then his poor food, the poverty of his clothing. Since, therefore, John was continually sending them to Christ, they, preferring to have John as teacher, send to him, thinking to draw him by flattery, so that he would declare himself the Christ. They send to him, therefore, not such persons as they sent to Christ, obscure messengers, servants and partisans of Herod, but priests and Levites, and not those from anywhere but Jerusalem, that is, the most honored among them. And they came that they might ask him, Who art thou? They came too, not as men who were ignorant and desirous of learning, but as I have said, to lead him on. But John answered them, not in accordance with their questions, but according to their own hidden purpose. And he confessed, and he did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. Note here the wisdom of the evangelist. For the third time saying almost the same thing, and revealing both the virtue of the Baptist and the malice and foolishness of the Jews. No true servant will seize on the dignity of his master and will reject it, though preferred to him by many. The multitude, because of ignorance, had come to think that they should regard John as the Christ. But these others were aiming, from the perverse mind with which they questioned him, to entice him by flattery to do what they wished. For unless this was their aim, they would not have immediately put the other questions and would have answered his words, I am not the Christ, by saying, We had not thought that you were. Did you think we came to ask you that? But being caught as it were and shown up, they go on to another question. Hence it follows, and they asked him, What then art thou, Elias? So what St. John Chrysostom is here saying is that the people that came to ask him questions were truly not seeking the truth, but seeking to trip up both St. John the Baptist and ultimately Christ. A little bit later, St. John Chrysostom says, Believe not that my baptism suffices. This is as if he were saying the words of St. John the Baptist. Believe not that my baptism suffices, for if my baptism were perfect, another would not come after me to give another baptism. This is but a preparation for his, that is Christ's. 
and will be absorbed into that which is nigh as a shadow and image. But after me he must come, who will declare the reality. For if the first were perfect, place for a second would not be required. And so he adds, who is preferred before me? He is nobler, more glorious. And so this reflects what we were learning a couple weeks ago, that St. John the Baptist has one foot in the Old Covenant and one foot in the New Covenant, and all of his baptism of the Old Covenant is but a foreshadowing of Christ's baptism in the New Covenant. For Christ can only be married to one bride, which is why Pope St. Gregory the Great writes, Or in a different sense, it was a custom of the ancients that if a man were unwilling further to retain the woman who was his wife, he should untie the sandals of the one who came by right of kinship to claim her as a bride. How has Christ appeared among men save as the bridegroom of holy church? John has said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, John chapter 3, verse 29. Rightly, therefore, does John declare that he is unworthy to untie his shoes, as though he were openly to say, I am unworthy to uncover the feet of the Redeemer, and the title of bridegroom, which belongs not to me, I shall not usurp. So what we learn from the fathers there is that Christ is the groom, and the church is the bride. You know, John said in John chapter 3, St. John the Baptist said, that he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth with joy because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's what St. John the Baptist said in John chapter 3. So notice, of course, even today, the friend of the bridegroom is clearly, in modern parlance, the best man. Now, a few of you probably had his best man at your wedding, the class clown, and that would be fine as long as he didn't get drunk and steal the show on your wedding day. But what type of best man does Christ choose to marry the church? St. John the Baptist is the best man of Christ, who not only never touched alcohol, but he was too serious about preparing the way for the old Israel to become the new Israel to ever think of clowning around. Yes, he has great joy, just as he said, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. But St. John the Baptist is solemn and sober, as he is the best man of Christ marrying the church. I wrote a blog post not too long ago about how in seminary, We all hear that the Catholic priest marries his parish or marries his diocese or marries the Catholic Church. It's not a bad theology, but St. Augustine's theology, who I prefer, says that the priest follows John the Baptist only as the best man because the Church, the Catholic Church, belongs only to Christ. And I think in this time of great clericalism where priests, bishops, others believe that they can make up new rules and new dogma, we probably should return to the theology of St. Augustine where We priests are simply the silent best men willing to die with Christ for the church while remembering the Catholic Church belongs to Christ. He is the bridegroom. John the Baptist is this best man who follows where the bloody groom will go. For both Jesus and John the Baptist die. They die for their convictions of truth. They both die for the bride, the new Israel. And even the church, the new Israel, Her garments are tinged in her own blood as we consider how many martyrs have entered gloriously the kingdom of heaven. A few weeks ago on the feast of St. Saturninus, we read at the end of the epistle in 2 Timothy 3.12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So think about that first word, all. Omnes in the Vulgate, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not some, but all. And who will suffer persecution? Not not just those who live bombastically in your face Christian lives, but anyone attempting, but honestly, trying to live a quiet, godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Meaning, if you haven't suffered at all for the gospel, you're not living a godly life in Christ Jesus. Sorry, it's not my words. It's right out of the Bible there. We all know that Sister Lucy of Fatima said, The decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and Satan will be over marriage and the family. We are so used to those words of Fatima, all of us traditional Catholics, that we don't really realize that's never been a debate in the church like now. Yes, the whole issue of marriage and family, that was a debate for those who left the church, like Luther and Henry VIII, 
But now we have the decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan over marriage and family within the church. I think often of St. Thomas More and St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist went looking for a fight in some sense. He went looking for a fight in calling out the sins against marriage of his day, and he lost his head. St. Thomas More, a great saint, did try to recuse himself from the battle. He looked for ways to stay silent about what the king was doing, but as we hear in that movie, A Man for All Seasons, his silence was bellowing up and down Europe. And guess what happens? Even this saint, who tries to live a godly, quiet life in Christ, he too loses his head for marriage. Isn't that an amazing connection between two saints with radically different personalities? St. Thomas More, the quiet one who wants to be people's friends. St. John the Baptist, who couldn't care less who's his friend. They both lose their heads over marriage. We don't have to go looking for a fight on this stuff, but we can't compromise the truth for the sake of being popular or even pastoral when Our Lady has made it clear how many souls are at stake regarding the sins of the flesh. You know, a reliable source said the Church Fathers said that the last age of the Church would not be one of miracles, but just one of perseverance. We've had so many martyrs since the death of Padre Pio, but sometimes I can't help but think, why did the age of miracles end, seemingly at least, with Padre Pio? So I don't know if we're at the end, but I do know if we want to triumph as victors in this decisive battle for the kingdom of Christ, we must be on God's side on this currently volatile issue of marriage and family that is so hotly debated not only without the church, but also within. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.